Good evening. I hope you're doing well today. Welcome to our Friday night wealth creation course. If you're just tuning in, my name is Jerry Feta. I'm the owner here at Wealth Dynamics. And I present these courses every single Friday. And the reason is, is I want to help create more financial education. Okay, more people who know about money, they know how it works. Because I didn't grow up that way. I didn't understand money growing up. It wasn't something that someone sat down and had a long talk with me. Um, they taught me how to procreate with humans. They didn't talk me, talk, teach me how to procreate with my money. Okay, I, I was dealing with money way before I was dealing with any of that other stuff. Right. So, so that's part of my story. And I want to share with you tonight, uh, should I save money in a college account? Okay, so if I'm watching this and I'm a parent, really the question is, should I be putting my money in a 529 plan, in a Coverdell ESA, in an UGMA, an UTMA, all of these, these, these uh, uh, random accounts we have that, that basically they pay for college, right? They pay for college. Um, now, the reason why I'm doing this particular topic, and last week, you know, we covered the 401k, is I started the year out with how do I set my 2020 financial goals, right? And then the next thing that I went over was I went over what are the top five concerns that most people have in 2020. So that was the second week. And then I looked at, all right, well, what am, what am I going to run into? What are the good intention, like New Year's resolutions that a lot of people are probably going to do with money that could potentially derail them, derail them? So that's why last week we talked about 401k. Okay, most people, they're going to have New Year's happen 2020. My goal is to save money for retirement. They're going to start plowing money. I'm plowing it into my 401k, thinking I'm doing a good thing when really I'm not. So we de debunked that myth last week. The next one we were thinking about, and it really parallels with the 401, is I want to start putting money away from my kids. Right? This really well-intentioned thing that, that I think you should do. I think you should save money up for, for your kids. Okay, I'm going to with my kids. But the question is, do I put it in a college fund? Okay, not should I save money? It's do I put it in a college fund? So a little bit about my backstory. I didn't go to college. So right out the gate, I didn't go to college. I thought I was supposed to all throughout high school. Everyone, I think starting in eighth grade, that was something that people started talking about a little bit. And then they talked about it a little bit more every single year. And by 10th grade, I decided that I was probably supposed to join the Air Force so they'd pay for my college uh, because I couldn't afford to go to college. And I didn't care enough about school to get a scholarship. And my parents weren't wealthy. We were, we were in poverty. And so there was no one saving for college. I realized, man, if I want to go to the college thing, I need, to, I need to probably make sure I have that covered because I knew that I didn't want to have debt. My family had debt. We had our house uh, foreclosed on. We had vehicles repoed. So I knew what debt was going to do. So I stayed away from that. But my goal was, okay, I'm going to go to the Air Force, do that thing. They'll pay for my college. Okay, big decision. I was probably 16. So think about 16. I'm thinking about, I'm going to sign on the dotted line and put my life on the line for my country. I don't even know about politics or, or like, I couldn't tell you anything. I just knew that that's how you get free college. Right. So, so I, I took a step back, thankfully. And what I realized was, well, why would I go to college? What's the purpose of college? And for me, I realized the purpose of college is to get a good career and get a good income. That was it. Like there was no, like, uh, it wasn't about socializing for me. It wasn't about being well-rounded. It was, well, I need to get a good job that's stable that I can keep for a long time. And I need something that pays the bills and, and I can actually like live on it and save money. And so when I took a step back and I was like, all right, so that's the purpose of college. Let me look around the, the people that I know that currently do have good jobs and they do make good money. And I saw, you know, immediately my teachers, cause I was in school at the time, my pastors, my coaches, all the people that I spent most of my time around. And then I started looking at my friend's parents and I started realizing the people that, that were my friends that had the nicest stuff that took vacations, their parents were business owners. So then I started thinking, okay, well, I need to go to college for business ownership then because they make the best money. They have the best jobs. I want to do that. So I started looking at, all right, well, who do I know that's a business owner? Did they go to college? As I started looking, I realized that most of them didn't or they did. And they went to college for something that they don't even use or apply today. Okay. And one person in particular, and this is my mindset now, this was something I heard when I was probably 16 or 17. He said, Jerry, why would I go to college to learn how to be in business from somebody who's never successfully run a business? Okay. Now I was kind of a, a, an average student, but I was smart enough to like, be like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Okay. I'm, I'm, I was a, at the time I was a personal trainer really into bodybuilding and fitness. 
So the equivalent of that to me was working with a fat personal trainer. Why am I going to learn how to get healthy from someone who's not healthy? Why would I go to college to learn business from someone who's not in business? Right? So that was my backstory. And what I realized was that um, for me, college wasn't a thing I did. I did do education. Okay. I would, I would probably bet that in the four years of probably 19 to um, 23, 24 years old, I did more education than my friends that did go to college. But I didn't do it through a professor. Professor, I did it through books, podcasts, courses, personal development, all this other stuff. So, so that's kind of my backstory. And being in the finance industry, doing what I do, helping people with their money, I want to really point out tonight, how should we be looking at this topic? Okay, let's break it down. Let's simplify it. And let's really look at what's the best way to do this. So a couple of the facts. I'm big on stats. Stats tell the story, right? Stats tell the story. So uh, the facts here, student loan debt right now in the country is over $1.4 trillion collectively. Okay, so we know that, that student loan debt, why, why would I have student loan debt? It means that I didn't have money to pay for college and it means that I got through college and I still didn't have money to pay for college and now I'm paying on this loan probably before I have a mortgage. In some cases, before I even have a car payment, I'm paying for student loan. $1.4 trillion, a, a trillion dollars, that's a lot of money. When I think of a trillion dollars, it's like, man, that's a ton. Uh, 53% of college graduates are either unemployed or not using their degree. 53%, so, and, and my guy Jeremy thinks that's more. I might agree with them, 53%. We know that's the stat that's reported uh, of college graduates are either unemployed or they're not using their degree. So let's take a step back at that, all right? So we already know $1.4 trillion in student loans. That means that people cannot pay for college. They're borrowing money they don't have and then they're not making the income to pay the money back. Right, so what do we say the purpose of college was? Earn a good income and have secure employment. So we already know that they're not earning a good enough income to pay that back. So the second part of that equation is to get a good job, to get a good career. More than a 50% chance that that won't happen. If you think about it that way, right? Think about an investment, 50-50 is already kind of risky, right? Half a chance I'm gonna lose money, half a chance I'm gonna make money. When we cross that barrier of 50% where there's a greater chance of me losing money on an investment than making money, I no longer want to be an investor, right? When I invest, like, especially on the deals I do, uh, uh, and this is not necessarily anything to do with college, I'd go off loan, loan to value ratios. I like to see a 50% loan to value ratio, meaning if I'm going to loan you hundred, what you're, what you're borrowing against is worth 200. So that if you don't pay me back, I actually made money, Right. So if I look at it from this standpoint, 53% chance that I'm not going to get my money back. That's kind of sketchy. That's, that's kind of sketchy. I look at that as a risk. Not only not get my money out of it, right? But I'm going to be unemployed or not even use my degree. Which means that I went to school for psychology and instead I work at AT&T. Or, or I went to school to be a nurse and instead I'm running a daycare. Right. And it, there's nothing wrong with what I end up doing. But the problem is, is that I paid good money, expensive money for a certain purpose and it's not paying me back and it's not being used for what I planned for. You, the average person I sit down with, that is almost always the case. I went to college. Don't use my degree now. Never used my degree. Couldn't find a job. Now I do this instead. I'm in sales. Right. Uh, the average college savings plan balance right now is $25,128 with a total of $352 billion in 529 savings plans across the United States. All right, now this is the one that I looked at uh, and I wanna kind of point out where my mind goes on this. So I thought 25,000, right? How much does that actually buy? One year, one year in a public school and in a private school is not even one year. So, so I'm putting 25,000 and what I'm doing as a parent, and this is unintentional so, I don't, unintentional, so I don't want to make any parents wrong. But if I'm doing this, I'm guaranteeing my, student, my child will have student loan debt. Why, why, why on earth would I expect that, that that only covers one year that I'm helping? They still have to go borrow the other three years now. I'm guaranteeing that they will have student loan debt by putting money into a 529 plan. Now, check this out. I want to show you guys the math on this. Being in the financial industry... Um, 
529 plans, they go into mutual funds, just like everything else does. And so if I have, uh, what do we say that number was? $352 billion. Let's see if this will even compute. $352 billion. I need three more zeros, okay. And, and this is all in mutual funds right now. The fee on that is about that. That's about a $5 billion annual industry, just in management fees just in management fees, and that's only on 529 plans. This is not counting covered LESAs. This is not counting uniform gift to minor or transfer to minor accounts. So we're probably looking at, I would say half a billion dollars just in these, these accounts, right? So when we look at the stats, I see student loan debt, that's 1.4 trillion. Someone's paying 6% interest and all that. I see Wall Street making $5 billion per year off my kids. Okay, and then what I'm going to dive into next here is the colleges themselves. Now, real quick on the student loan debt. Student loan debt is 32000 So that means we have financial proof that there's about half, more than half left over even after we use the 529. So check this out. Uh, college tuition has an inflation rate of 7% per year. Who can guess uh, what CPI reports at usually? Consumer price index. Maybe two or three. So that means that the US government says goods and services only go up by two or 3% in cost, but somehow college tuition went up by 7%. That's three times, that's more than three times more than CPI. Um, now this is the one that, that blew my mind. I knew it was bad, I didn't know it was this bad. Who knows what an endowment fund is? Okay, so an endowment fund, an endowment means a gift, right? So a lot of colleges are nonprofit. They're not for profit industries, right? So that means that all the money is gifted to them. An endowment fund is money that's given to an institution and that institution then invests the money. So when I looked at how much do colleges across the nation currently have invested, $650 billion, that's how big colleges are as an industry, not student loans in Wall Street, just the financial, financial institution of a college. That means that their net asset value as, as a group of institutions is $650 billion with a 7% raise in price every single year, funded by Wall Street and on the back end paid for by student loan debt. Colleges are making a ton of money, look at this. So, so when I look at just the facts, this is to me predatory. That's, that's what I think of. I'm thinking of, all right, we have kids that have no, no idea what they're gonna do. My kid has no idea what he's gonna do at 16, 17, 18 when he's told he needs to sign up for college, okay? But I'm gonna force him to go because I'm gonna stick 25 grand in a 529 plan and say, hey, that was really good money I saved up for you. You better feel guilty about it, go to college. Knowing that that's not gonna pay for college. All that's gonna do is whet the appetite for the student loan debt. Here's one year, you have to go borrow the other three. Now they're in student loan debt doing this. Wall Street already made their $5 billion in fees, and the college just made a bunch of money on top of what they're already making, inflating their rates more than any other goods and services cost. How is that not predatory? Like, that's not okay. So, so I want to really dive into these are the numbers. This is not my opinion. These are the facts. And America right now is so stuck on this college thing. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and, and agree with you. If I am laying in an operation room and a surgeon goes, yeah, I didn't go to school, <laughs> then I'm probably not going to let him do the operation. But here's the thing. Most kids aren't becoming surgeons. Okay, most kids are, are becoming real estate. There's, there's a real estate agent college degree now. Okay, you, you can, like, how much is the real estate agent test just in real life? A few hundred dollars. So you could go a few hundred dollars and make millions, or you could spend probably 60 grand to do the same thing, right? It's a product, it's a financial product that's, that's being basically touted by financial institutions. This, this when they counted up student loan debt, I think this was back in 2015 or 16, um, they counted it up and all the revenue made by the student loan debt, it would have been the, the second most profitable company in the world. I think next to Exxon Mobil, like it was huge, right? So that's a ton of money that's being made. We already know Wall Street's making billions on top of that. And then the colleges are making billions. Meanwhile, our children are coming out not, not able to pay their bills. 
and not getting the exact thing that they said they would pay for. I'm paying for a job. I didn't get a job, right? At least I would want a guarantee, like a money back guarantee. If you don't get employed, we'll, we'll pay you all the money back, right? So those are the facts. Now, here are some of the myths that I want to go over. And I thought about not what are the myths that are out there for everyone. I was thinking about what are the myths that I heard? When I was that age, what are the myths that I heard? Because I heard that college is necessary to find a good job. Okay, we know that's not true. There's so many jobs out there that you don't need college. Just an FYI, when I'm interviewing, if somebody has a college degree, in my opinion, when I'm the boss, which in this company I am, they actually are at a disadvantage with me. Because I know that they, they I know what they learned that four years. And I know what they learned that four years is not going to help them in the real world. It actually hinders them. So, so it's not necessary to have a degree to find a good job. Uh, when we first got married, Lexi, you worked at at and What did you make your first year there, entry level? 60K working retail. Okay, how many people do we know of that went to college to get a job that pays 60K? All of them. All of them are doing that. That's 50, 60, 70K. Like that's the reason people go to college. So Lexi, you know, entry level retail, she wasn't even killing it at sales. If she went back to AT&T now, I guarantee she clears six figures in retail sales, right? So I'm saying you don't need college. I don't need college to find a good job. My kids don't need college to find a good job. That's a myth. Uh, those with a degree out earn those without one. Now, what I, what I saw on this was some stats. It showed that those with a degree make, I think, about two times more than those that don't have a degree. But I want to point out this. Somebody that gets a degree, and this is averages, right? Averages means that, that this side's scolding hot, this side's ice cold, and if we meet in the middle, somehow that's warm, right? But we know that's not the case. Averages means that we're looking at what is the average person doing? Well, we look at the, not the fact that they went to college. Look at what type of kid goes to college. The smart, ambitious ones. So if we fly above that and, and we get rid of the college degree, we would say smart, ambitious kids make twice as more than those who aren't. Right? Like the kids that I know that didn't go to college, other than me at my school, like they went to work at Fred Meyer. Nothing against that, but they're going to make $15 per hour there. Right, most of the smart, ambitious kids, even my my best friend who was anti-college, went to college because he got a scholarship. Right, so so if we just fly above the behaviors that make a kid go to college, they care about their future. They're ambitious. They pay attention. They're good studiers. They're they're motivated. They're self-motivated, and they can persist. Think about it. even if it's wrong information, they got through four years of college. Right, so if we compare the kids that have those qualities to the kids that don't have those qualities. Of course, we're going to see that they earn more income. But my my thought is that that has nothing to do with the degree. It has everything to do with their behavior. It means that they are good kids. It means they're hard workers. It doesn't mean they're lazy, and and it doesn't mean the degree is magic. Right. Um, the next myth is that a college savings plan will help me pay for my child's college. We just saw that's not true. It's all it's going to do is it's going to guarantee that they get in student loan debt. 25 grand out of, out of 75 they've got to pay total is not going to help. Uh, college will make my, my child a more well-rounded and successful person. Let me tell you what, most of the kids that, that were my peers that were in college, you want to know what they were doing? They were partying. Okay, they were getting drunk. They were doing drugs. They were sleeping around. They were not becoming more well-rounded. They were becoming round. Okay, alcohol calories, they stick on higher than even fat calories do. They weren't becoming more successful. By the time they graduated, I was already successful in business. So we can't say college will make my child more well-rounded and successful. Now, again, I don't want to make anyone wrong. You should want your child to be more well-rounded in life and successful. But I'm saying college does not guarantee that that will happen. That's a myth. Okay, the other myth is that my child needs to go to college. I made go in caps because... We're, we're in the mindset that they need to leave the house and go to an institution where they live on, 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 in the dorms and they go see the professor and they sit in the classroom. If my kid went to school, I would tell them go online. And I would tell them do it at nighttime after you're done working because you don't need to go to college. Most of my best learning I've done at home. Okay, I didn't go see a professor and all this stuff. I did it at home. So online school right now is a very viable option and it's a fraction of the cost. So it's a myth that my kid needs to go and have this university experience. Like 
all of that is really just like polished up by these billion dollar colleges because they know it takes marketing and advertising to seem prestigious to make your kids want to go there. And you as a parent, I'm going to go ahead and, and get on your side real quick. As a parent, you feel like, like, like an a-hole if your kid's like, dad, I just got accepted to Harvard. And you're like, no, son, you can't go. Like, so they're, they're playing your kids against you a little bit, right? We've got to understand that. And then finally, the next one is that I need to start saving for my child. Now, I've seen families that are in debt up to their eyeballs, but man, they put money in the 529. Just like they max out as much as they can max out to get the free match on their 401k. If I'm not doing well financially, I have no business thinking about how I'm going to pay for my kid's college. Okay, and, and it's a very noble thought, but here's the reality. If, if I don't take care of business for me and I pay for my kid's college, guess who's paying for my nursing home? Because I didn't take care of myself. They will go broke on college and on me because I didn't take care of myself before I took care of them. Right, nobody wants that. And I've seen clients that had to do that. They were in the position where they're like, yeah, I got to go care for mom and dad now. I've got to drop what I'm doing. I've got to put life on hold. And, and they're loving and, and, and you, you have to really respect them for it. But even though it's not nice to think about, we go back, it was due to the parents' lack of planning. So you don't need to be saving for college if you're not saving for yourself first and handling business at home. So I want to break down the image first. I reversed this a little bit. I'm throwing everyone off this week. So should I save my money in a college fund? Intentions versus reality. So if I'm saving money for my kid's future, that's my intention, right? Intention versus reality. My intention is I'm saving money for my kid's future. If I'm saying I put money in a 529, now you have to go to college, I'm actually limiting my child's future. What if that wasn't in the, in the cards for them? What if they wanted to do something entirely different, but now because I gave them 25 grand, they have to go, right? So I'm limiting their future by doing that. Uh, I think I'm paying for their college, but I'm actually increasing the likelihood that they're going to have student loan debt. We've talked about that. I'm helping my child become an investor. I've had some families that, that look at it and they're like, man, this is my child's 529. They're going to sit down with the Edward Jones guy and he's going to let them pick Disney stock and they're going to be an investor and it's going to be so great. That's not an investor. That's a consumer. Okay. My kid is not an investor. My kid is now another consumer of Wall Street financial products. All I'm doing is training them up to do the same mindless thing that I do right now with my 401k plan. Give it to Wall Street. They're going to go make a bunch of money and leave me hanging. I'm being a responsible parent. I'm actually giving up responsibility. Again, I know that's not my intention. My intention, again, is I'm being a responsible parent, but I'm actually giving up responsibility to Wall Street. I'm saying, let's give it to them. Hopefully, they do a good job with it. Your future is in their hands now. All I'm going to do is make the $250 a month payment. Hopefully, they do their job so you can go to college. Everyone else I know does it. In this instance, everyone else I know is in $1.5 trillion worth of student loan debt. And then lastly, it's this or the bank. We're going to talk tonight about a couple of alternatives. The sacred account, one of my favorite things for saving for my child. When I have kids, they're all going to have sacred accounts. Okay. So, so this allows me to save for my child without restriction. I'm able to actually put that money to work. Um, now, a few different things I want to go over. What am I actually saving for? This is critical. So if I am putting money away for my kids, Jeremy, you have kids. Tell me, tell me how accurate this statement feels for you. The purpose is saving for my child to pursue opportunities to build a better future without being inhibited by the lack of financial resources until they are stable and living life on their own without my assistance. When you think of what's the purpose of saving for your children. Before or after these, <laughs> you and I started hanging out because before it was to ensure that my kids have a better life than I did. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was their age. Yeah. So now it's more like for me. <laughs> yeah. And and that's that's a that's a paradigm shift. Jeremy's saying before he was a client, it was kind of make sure they were set, but now he's really looking at my set. I need to be set so that I'm not a burden to them. Right. But if we think about when I am saving for my kids, I want them to pursue opportunity. I don't want my kids to ever say I couldn't do that because finances were an issue. When they're learning, when they're young, they're developing, they're getting on track with their life. I want them to say, hey, if I did want to go to college, you know, if I did want to be a surgeon, that's not off the table. I've got the money and resources to do that. Right. Uh, I'm also looking at 
uh, uh, until they're stable and living life on their own. So if I'm giving them student loan debt when they're 18 years old, that they're never going to pay off and they're having that happen before they're stable and actually living on their own, likelihood is that they're probably coming back home after they graduate. It happens all the time. And on top of that, they're never paying that thing off. And if I co-signed on it, it's coming with me when they die, right? So what am I saving for? That's the intention. And I want you to realize the intention has nothing to do with college. The intention has everything to do with improving the potential for opportunity for my children as they grow old, as they become more mature in life. So here are my options. I can send my kids to college. Definitely could do that first on the list, right? I could also send them to trade school. Okay, a lot of times that's, what do you say, about two years? Year to two years. Year to two years in trade school. And, and, and they have, usually in trade school, there's a high demand. So I have a client, he's, um, Lexi, how old is Micah, Cliver? Uh, 20. Micah's 20. Micah went to trade school and he already had a six-figure job lined up for him when he left. And they have guarantees. Most of them have guarantees. Guarantees. There's a lot of like union type jobs, like things that, that you don't necessarily get if you go to college. So trade school is a viable option. Uh, another one's business. I didn't do college. I did business. Okay. And I was sucky at it for like five years, but I figured I was going to spend that time in school anyways. And I didn't have debt when I got out. Uh, apprenticeships. This is a, an old school and I love apprenticeships. So a lot of times like this is overlooked, but this is how professionals used to get trained. They would work with an apprentice. Um, Andrew Carnegie, he was the founder and owner of US Steel, sold that thing for, for millions of dollars. He was an apprentice. Started as an apprentice and he worked his way up. So if there's an opportunity for my kid to maybe go work in an industry that they're sure of, work with someone that's an expert, be their right-hand person, learn it all directly from them, and then go win afterwards, that's awesome. That's much better to me. Uh, there's secondary education programs, professional licensing. Uh, we were talking about mortgage brokers, real estate uh, agents. Uh, uh, you can become a barber. You can become an insurance guy. Like There's all these licenses I can go get that have nothing to do with college. The other one is investing. Okay, if I'm really financial minded and my kid gets this stuff, I might have them start investing in my deals when they're like three, four and five just for fun. But by the time they're a kid, like, like maybe 10, 12 years old and they get this stuff, imagine if they're actually cutting lawns and, and selling phone books or whatever else they can do at that age and putting that money in investments. Okay, I did some math on this. If I can find a way for my kid to make eight fifty a month, eight fifty a month, and put that away for twenty four years when they're twenty four years old, at ten percent, my child will be a millionaire. Imagine that, like everyone else graduated college, my kid is a millionaire. Ten percent on a million is a hundred thousand dollar income each and every year, passive off their investments. Okay, and I'm not saying build a trust fund, baby. I'm saying like, if this made sense and your kid was into it and interested though, like the way Warren Buffett was, he was buying pinball machines at like 14 years old, right? Renting those out and putting, putting that money into stocks, right? So if my son or my daughter gets that, I would love to be able to say, hey, my kid didn't go to college. They're a professional investor. Okay, they had a million dollars in a trust that we built up from the time they were little all the way through. Uh, internships are another one. And then volunteer opportunities. These are all options, and I probably missed some. These are all options for my child to better their future. It doesn't have to be college, guys. If I do a 529 plan, I'm basically only doing like this one, this one, and maybe this one. Okay, we have a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've, I've limited myself to basically a third of the, of the list that that money can be used for without being penalized. All right. So here are the realities of college. A lot of the information is outdated. It's old. The textbooks are old. They're expensive. It's stuff that, that I might learn. And five years later, they find out none of it was true. Do I get money back? No, they're not going to give me money back. They're like, yeah, you paid for your degree. You got your degree. Things change. That sucks. You still have to pay student loan debt on that money. Outdated format, professor, brick and mortar location. Overpriced. Most of the information, and I will be honest with you, you could get for free on Google. Okay, you literally could go on Google and you can research and learn all of, all of this basic stuff and figure it out. YouTube, like you could go pull up tutorials on the craziest things on YouTube right now for free. 
The which academy? Khan Academy. Khan Academy. I'm not sure. It's not C O N, right? K A H N. Okay. The so the Khan Academy. Apparently, they do online college level courses for free. So college itself, at that brick and mortar, like traditional pace that they do today, is overpriced. Uh, more than 50% chance I won't use my degree. I'm in debt before I have a, a job, and I've limited my horizons. Okay, I have clients like like in the 18, 19 range. Uh, one of them I'm thinking of in particular, and she started college, started a business. The business blew up, and she thinks she needs to quit the business to go back and finish college because that that's what you're supposed to do. That's terrible. I would never encourage someone to do that. So I want to give you guys uh, just some alternative savings methods. So we've talked about you don't have to do college for your kids. And if you're saving, like don't limit it to where the money has to be for college. If you can keep it open-ended to where your child could use that for college, they could use that for a business, they could use that for investing. There's tons of things they could do. So here's the first one I want to show you guys. This is the sacred account. Okay, setting up a life insurance policy that your kid owns. Right. Again, this has to be done correctly. There's 99% of these that aren't. Um, when I establish this policy correctly, I can set it up with high early cash value, meaning when money goes into it, that money is available to be pulled against right away. If I'm a parent that's an investor, that's money that I'm going to pull out and piggyback onto all my deals. Okay, if I'm buying properties, even if it's a thousand bucks, I'm going to borrow that from my kids' cash value, stick that in the deal so I can pay them every single month because that's going to build up by the time they're 15, 20, 25 years old actively borrow against and invest my child's money on their behalf while they're young, right? Now, the benefit of this and the beauty of this is, like I said, when they are 10, 12 years old and they actually are learning and they know math and all this stuff is like clicking, they're becoming financially literate at that age. And you would be just surprised at like what they could learn. I would have probably learned algebra way faster if they put dollar signs in front of all the numbers, like hundred percent. It would have been like, boom, I'm in. How do I make this thing grow, right? Uh, so this is a way to actually encourage that. And then once they're old enough, grant them access to the income you've built up from the assets. So that way they have income to live off of while they're going through school, while they're learning, while they're starting the business. And then they also have the balance in the sacred account, in the cash value that they can use for different stuff too. Okay, now I'm probably putting this in a trust. That's why I use the word grant in specifically. I put that in a trust so that they can't just pull it for whatever. But it's there and it's available and it's not just a 529 where if they didn't use it for tuition, they're getting a penalty, right? And then my child now has surplus income to live on and they have money for their future. And this is a plan that I'm going to say is better if you have money to save today. So if I have excess or surplus budget money, that's money I'm going to save today for my child's future. And I can use that plan. Now, this one is dope. This is, uh, Jeremy's going to love this. What's up, Eric and Cass? They're going to love this too. So this is using your mortgage. Okay, so a lot of parents don't even consider this, right? We think mortgage, we think pay it off, it's bad to have, get rid of it, right? Mortgage, more means death, so we think of that. Uh, this would actually be convert my mortgage to a first lien home equity line of credit. All that means is I get rid of my mortgage entirely, and instead I have a line of credit. I can pay into it and pay my house off. I can actively pull out of it and use it as well. So I'm going to refinance my home into a first lien uh, home equity line of credit. And the reason this works is almost everyone has a home. Almost everyone wants to pay their home off. And if you could, almost everyone would use their home equity to do stuff, right? But we want to do it intelligently. So I'm going to pay extra money toward the principal of that each and every month. And then I'm actively borrowing against that value, that, lo that loan, that line that I can draw against, and I'm going to invest that, just like I could do with my sacred account. Pull out, invest, build cash flow, pay myself back, and just repeat that as my, my child grows older. Uh, once I move out, check this out. Once I move out of this house and they're an adult, I'm going to rent that to them or I'm going to owner finance it to them, depending on how I want to do it. If I rent it to them, I'm going to do it through an S corp so I can get tax free income. If I owner finance it to them, I'm just going to do an owner finance note, keep the HELOC on it, and then they'll pay my mortgage payment. The beauty of this is I just got retirement income as the parents and my child has somewhere to live and they have an asset. Right, so if they have an asset, that means it's theirs. They could potentially sublease that out for income. I'm also gonna borrow against the equity to help them pay for their education costs. Okay, so how cool would it be for me to say, hey, I pulled six figures of home equity out of my house, paid for my kid's college, and they pay me back instead of the student loan debt. I'm a much more flexible creditor, and I've also got retirement income. A lot of families that maybe didn't plan ahead, this is a great, like, 
reach into the back seat and fix this up really quick. And then you've got this thing set up to where you're making rental income off of that or mortgage income off of that. And you're earning interest off the student loans that you know, would have gone to the government instead. Now they're going to me because I financed my child's college, right? So this is beautiful. So they have somewhere they could sublet to earn income, right? So they've got a roof over their head as well. They're technically now a homeowner if I do owner finance this. And if I, if I do all of my reporting correctly, I can be helping them build credit too. See, so I'm thinking more about just school. I'm thinking about how do I improve their future? So I'm doing this. I have rental income. I have money from what I loan them. And my child does not owe anything to the government. Like, that's beautiful. That's perfect. And imagine if you did both of these. Imagine if I saved money for them and I also did this strategy, right? And if I did this one, this one has life insurance. So when my child dies, the death benefit will pay to the trust. Guess what? The grandkids are set up now. I just created like this ongoing like wealth vehicle that's going to basically fund my family's college, education, business ventures, whatever it might be. And by the way, this is how wealthy people have done it. It's not, you're probably not going to hear about it from your financial advisor, but it is historically how wealthy people have done this. So the excuses, why wouldn't I do this? Because with the college stuff, the 529 plan, the Coverdell, it's what everyone else does right? It's common. It's what all of my friends are doing. My peers are doing it. My coworkers are doing it. But again, we have to look at the stats, guys. If I'm looking at the stats, everyone else right now is in $1.5 trillion of student loan debt. Okay. Everyone else right now has is, is got $352 billion in 529 plans paying Wall Street $5 billion a year in fees. Okay. Everyone else is paying overinflated tuition to these endowments that have $650 billion in assets under management that they're just sitting on still increasing the tuition price by 7% every year. Do I really want to be everyone else? Because if I don't, I can't use that excuse. That's got to come off the table. Okay. And then the final one is that it's the only option I have. It's either I do the 529 or I put it in a bank. Okay. And that's the point of this course is I want to show you just those two options. Most people would never consider those. Okay. It's not something I was educated on as a financial advisor. When I got licensed, they never once said, Jerry, hey, you could use life insurance and it's way better. Or, or Jerry, here's this course on how to use mortgages so that you don't have to do the 529 at all. You can actually build wealth for yourself and for your family instead of just giving it to institutions, right? So I have to get rid of these two excuses. This one's going to come through education. This one really is, guys, just look. Just look at my peers. If I don't want to be that way, I can't do the same things they're doing. I can't expect that I'm going to get different results if I do. So here's what I do. This is the action steps. I always leave you with action steps. First, stop putting money into college savings plans. Okay, if I don't specifically know why it's going in the college fund, I shouldn't be putting it there. Okay, I need to have purpose and intention with every single one of my dollars. Uh, sit down with us. We'll do a plan for you, no cost at all. And we'll look at your options. We'll say, should you put it in a 529? Should you put it into life insurance? Should you do the mortgage thing? Or is there a totally different option you could be focused on right now? Okay, but a lot of it is, is actually looking at options and then weighing the pros and cons and deciding which option fits me the best versus like, this is what I have to do because it's all I know and this is what everyone else does. Uh, decide, do I want to do life insurance? Do I want to do a HELOC? Do I want to do both of them? Like I said, really drawing out the projections of what you're trying to create and what my future should look like and then just finding which tools create that, Okay. And then once I do that, I can begin funding it. So there's a little period here where we're probably not putting money away till we figure out what we're going to put it into, why and where it's going. That's okay. Like it's okay for you to not do anything until you know that you've got a good plan in place. Once we do, I would probably establish a revocable living trust and I'm going to put the life insurance in the house in that. You want to do that anyways. It's just good for estate planning. But if I'm doing this with my kids and I'm doing that whole flow where I pay for school and they rent, I definitely want that in a trust so that they're not 18 years old and inheriting a million dollars out of nowhere. A trust allows me to say, hey, no, you can only use it under these circumstances. And it shelters them from some taxes so that they're not being given all of this money all at once. Then once I've got that done, I go into education mode. So I would be focusing on teaching my kids about money. Okay, and that might mean that I need to go learn about money. If I don't understand it, it doesn't mean I should avoid it. Money is one of those topics that parents don't talk about because we were never taught about it. It's kind of taboo. And so we just never talk about it. The problem is that our kids pick it up anyways. And it's not going to be good the way they pick it up if it wasn't intentional. They'll, they'll, they'll maybe grab it out of the wrong context. 
or they'll just mimic and, and kind of see what their peers are doing, which we kind of already know what that looks like. All right, last two steps here. Once I have all of this done, my job is to provide my child with as many experiences and opportunities as I can so that they know what they like and don't like. Because what I've created is our own funding source. It'll fund whatever we tell it to fund. So I want to help my child get very specific on what do I want to do with my future? Do I like business? Okay, maybe I spend time with business owners and figure out, yeah, I loved that. Or no, that was terrible. Or, or is it college? Or is it something entirely different? The best way is actually have your child do it. And if they do it long enough and they sample it and they figure it out, they're going to have a reality on what that means. And then finally, then I can help my child with their future. We can disperse all of this money and put it to work. Right. But it goes back to our three main points, guys. You need to make sure that you aren't confused about money. You need to be simple. Okay. So if I look at the statement on the 529 and I see the 30 different funds that it's in, that's not simple. That's not, it's confusing to me. Okay. The second thing is I need to make sure that I'm not losing money fees, interest, like all these institutions we pay, that's losing money. And then thirdly, I need to be able to use my own money. So if I can't use my own money, then it's not good for me. If I stick it into a 529 and a Coverdell and there's penalties for how I use my money. Uh, I have a client right now. He's like 50 something, definitely not going to college. Bro has like 70 grand in his 529 plan still. And he's afraid to cash it out. Like I've told him, cash it out. We can figure out the taxes on the back end, but at least go put that to work, right? So, so that's the problem is we can't use that money, all right? So guys, I'm gonna wrap up here. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? Do we have any questions online tonight? Uh, we got one from Gene. He's asking, what do you think of a trade school? Gene, I think trade school is good. Um, I think that's a really inexpensive way to get a great income. Um, so I think that's definitely a viable option. Um, I would think more importantly is what does your kid feel about trade school? And you, if you're helping pay for it. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I think that's it. Awesome. So guys, thank you so much for watching. We will leave the replay up over the weekend. So if you want to check this out, by the way, we do these courses free every single Friday. So if you enjoyed the content tonight, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. If you want to get more like this, go to sacredaccount.com. Okay, you can also go to membership.jerryfetta.com. And I have probably three or four of my best courses up there for you to watch. You don't need to give me your email or, or put anything in. Just go enjoy them. And if you like them, reach out. We can get you some more. So guys, have a great night. Enjoy your weekend. I'll talk to you next time.